You're listening to episode three of D6 Pack, recorded on February 18th, 2017. Welcome to D6 Pack, the premier podcast about beer, board games, and the surrounding culture. On this episode, we will sample Breckenridge Brewery's Oatmeal Stout, discuss what's cracking, and dive into an in-depth review of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. I'm Travis Keatley, and here are my co-hosts. I'm David Westfall. And I'm Todd Marsh. Hello, D6 Pack fans. Thank you, first and foremost, for tuning into another episode of this journey that is the D6 Pack podcast. And um, I want to take a second to apologize for having the episode actually be released a week later than we had originally planned and than what was promised. Um, with the shorter month that is February and other time constraints, uh, you know, we needed that extra week. But, you know, it allowed us to put our passion and talents into the podcast that we could deliver, you know, the best one yet. So thank you for sticking with us on this journey and let's get right into it. Let's dive into our new brew for this month's episode. All right. So for today's episode, we are going to be reviewing Breckenridge Brewery's Oatmeal Stout. So as always, I'm going to start off this episode with reviewing the description from Breckenridge's website. It's a bold, smooth-bodied concoction that oozes dark roasted coffee aromas and flavors of espresso and semi-sweet chocolate. We round out these heady pleasures with a dose of flaked oatmeal for a creamy body and a semi-dry finish. Unforgettable. And... Breckenridge claims this has a IBU of 36 and an alcohol by volume content of 5%. So, oatmeal stouts are typically a, a pretty dark beer, so I'm expecting something pretty heavy and um, full flavored. So, let's crack them and see what, see what it's like. Here we go. Okay. All right. The smell is very beer-like. I'm not liking it. Yeah. It's got a heavy, so yeah. Heavy pressure. Very strong. It's not my thing, apparently. It's definitely it's thick. It's thick. Definitely very thick. dark. Very dark. Holy cow. Holy cow. cow. It's like a... Like a it's got a bit a of a coffee beer. aroma to it. Like a, yeah, it does. Smell that. I'm hoping that's stronger than the oatmeal. And the taste. Hmm. Oh. It's creamy. <clears throat> Thick and creamy. Thick and creamy, heavy pleasures. Um, wow. <laughs> it's going to be, a, it's gonna be uh, an interesting night with this one. Yeah, this is going to be a, a long one. Yeah, don't don't drink too fast. This is a sipper. Don't worry. I, won't. I, only, got, I only have one of these, so I'm not going to drink it too fast. Oh, I've, I've got a second one here for... Yeah, I wish I could have him. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So, yeah, we'll come back to that at the end. and All right, let's dive into what's cracking. Now it's time to find out what's cracking in our D6 pack update. Okay. So, first thing I want to talk about, um, one of my favorite TV shows as a kid, no, not Power Rangers this time, but probably this is probably my next favorite TV show. Um, Power Rangers was definitely my favorite show when I was like a kid, and this was my favorite TV show. You know, middle school and just like coming into high school that time frame. And that show was, of course, Dragon Ball Z. Now, David, I know you watched the show as well. Oh, Super yeah. fun show. One of the best animes of all time, in my opinion. Awesome characters. You know, bunch of fighting, cool powers. You know, Super Saiyans, attacking, fighting all sorts of bad guys. Great story. Story about family and, you know, fighting for each other and, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, moving and working and training, you know, to move past obstacles and better yourself and yada, yada, yada. So that show ended uh, production in, like, 2005. Okay, so... Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, uh, and that's when it ended in the U.S. In the original 
the original airing in Japan was from ended in 1996. So for them, it's been almost 20 years, and for us, it's been about 10 years. And what I mean is now Dragon Ball Super is the new show that just came out. Um, continues that storyline a few months. It picks up again a few months after the end of Dragon Ball Z. Follows the same characters. Um, introduces them into you know some new bad guys, some new challenges. Um, in English, the English dub has only aired about six episodes so far. So it, it just started the beginning of this year in January in English. But it has been going. It has been going on for about a year in Japan. So there's, you know, there's a, a good amount of stories already been created and whatnot. So, um, so I, I've been watching that. Um, it's been awesome. It's brought me back to the original. It's great seeing these characters again. Um, this show, you know, combines action and fighting, but also has like a comedy aspect to it. So it's been funny seeing the characters and like, you know, watching a character like Vegeta, you know, shopping for clothes. You know, for people who you know, people can imagine who know what that is and can imagine that it's like you know, really funny to think of that. But you know, he does that, and Goku's off training. You know, if I was the main character is Goku, obviously he's awesome. He's my favorite. Um, so it's been it's been pretty good so far. Introduced a new bad guy, Beerus the Destroyer. He's the actual he's actually a god. Um, so that's gonna be. Fun seeing Goku fight him. He's super strong so far, and uh, I've been I've been loving it so far. Can't wait to watch more. So, are you caught up with the most recent episodes, Todd? Yeah, I've watched them all. Like I said, there's only been six so far. So, yeah, I'm fully caught up. Yeah, I've been watching them too, and I've been enjoying it a lot. It's, yeah, like you said, it's following the original series and um, kind of just picked up where that left off. And like you, I've, this is something that brings me back to my childhood, something right. that I was missing, and uh, I've been enjoying it. The only thing, though, is, um, did you see the movie, uh, I think it was Battle of the Gods? Yes. No. It It's a Dragon Ball Z movie, but um, it it seems like, so far, Dragon Ball Super is just like a remake of that movie. Well, so the movie you're referring to, uh, Dragon Ball Z Battle of the Gods, and the, actually there's another movie, Dragon Ball Z Resur- Resurrection F. Those movies were created after the uh, after the D- Dragon Ball Super was created in Japan. So they literally took footage from Dragon Ball Super, kind of edited it down a little bit to create little movies for little, like, previews here in the U.S. in English. So literally those two movies, if you've seen them, are kind of like the first, kind of like just a breakdown of the first couple storylines of Dragon Ball Super. I'm glad I haven't watched Resurrection F then. (laughs) Yeah, I've actually seen both of them, so I kind of know what's going to happen right away. But the show expands everything so you're getting more content and you're getting definitely you're getting more of that um you're seeing more of like the secondary characters more of them like getting more of the comedy spots in the tv show and everything so for me it's been nice to see those little spots even though i kind of know what's coming ahead so that's Hmm. been nice but i'm really looking forward to what's coming next you know way down the road but, One of so the additions have... that I feel like this is added on to Dragon Ball Z <laughs> is Trunks and Go, Go, Go Ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think those guys. guys are hilarious. Their storyline is just kind of off the wall, and it's a lot of comic relief, like you were talking about. So, I, right? Yeah, they're s- super funny, and yeah. Travis, did you watch the show at all? You know, that's what I was kind of staying quiet over here for. I um. Uh, I'm not really a fan of this show, nor am I a fan of any anime. Um, I've tried mm-hmm. to watch some of it, but it just hasn't been my thing, so I don't know enough about it to really get excited or comment on it. Right. Anime is the type of thing where if you watched it when you were younger, 
you are probably going to become more of a fan of it because most animes are very whimsical and fantastical and, you know, really out there. And yeah. That, and just that style. Yeah, that you style. Know, that cartoon style that, you know, is different than American cartoons. So if you grew up watching just American-style cartoons and see this, it's, you know, night and day difference. Yeah. And it's something, as an adult, it's probably hard. To, it would be hard to get into and watch. Yeah, yeah, you know? I agree. But I, right, so I'm enjoying it, and I'm, like you said, Todd, I'm looking forward to what's coming after the Battle of the Gods storyline, so... It's. Pre- I'd say the next storyline is crazier than the the this first one, so it's gonna be sweet. I loved Frieza's part in Dragon Ball Z, so I'm. I can only imagine that that's gonna be crazy. Yeah. All right. So um, I think I'll take it away with my next topic. It sounds cool. good. So this is a movie that I saw a little while ago, but um, it was something that I kind of enjoyed and. Uh, wanted to talk about here um and that is the passengers or just passengers which stars uh jennifer lawrence and chris pratt there's pretty much the only people in the movie i mean there's a couple of other people but they're not main characters so the the general plot of the movie is that these two are some of, like, thousands of passengers on this ship that's traveling to another world. And they're supposed to be hibernating through this entire time. And um, Chris Pratt's chamber malfunctions, and he wakes up early. And then he wakes up Jennifer Lawrence so that he's not alone. And there's problems going on with the ship that that caused Chris Pratt to wake up. Um, I don't remember his character's name, but, uh, anyway, his character wakes up early and it's caused by these malfunctions. So all these malfunctions are causing other problems that they have to deal with throughout the movie and, um, just seeing how they interact with each other and try to overcome those obstacles is, is entertaining. Um, Mm -hmm. it's not something that I would say is like... Here's what's got us hype. Gonna make film of the year or anything for me, but mm-hmm. um, it was fun. I enjoyed watching it. There was a little bit of comedy mixed with sci-fi and everything, so um, I'd say check it out if you guys get a chance. So I um, wanted to see this movie initially when I saw the trailer for it, but then my roommates actually went and saw it, and they said it was a good thing that I wasn't there because it was more of a movie that couples should go see together is that I mean is that the vibe you got from it Dave because that's what I was told I no <laughs> was it not I all, mean, was it not about the romance and all that jazz and no I mean there was their romance was a big part of the movie but I don't think it was the only part of the movie okay okay I think you can still enjoy the action and that's involved as long as you I mean if if you're going for an action movie just because it's an action movie then yeah this isn't what you want to see yeah but um, if you like the a little bit of drama mixed into the action uh, I think this is this is a good movie okay did you find that it was slow because I also heard that the plot was kind of slow and it dragged on Um, in parts. Okay. Um, but it made it easy to run to the bathroom. (laughs) (laughs) All righty then. Uh, yeah, it it was slow in some parts, but, um, I don't know. I, I'm a fan of pretty much anything sci-fi, and this had multiple different elements to that. But it, it was also kind of a story that wasn't so far out there that it was like you couldn't relate to it. Mm Mm-hmm. So I appreciated that. Um, I did see it with Adrian, though, so I, maybe my opinion's a little biased on that. Uh-huh. But, right. Um, well, I, I, I um, for me, I think I'd this... I'd probably watch it by myself. This will be definitely something that I check out once it um, hits my nearest Blu-ray rental, you know, yeah, kind of store or whatever. But, Todd, what do you think? Yeah, this was... 
I saw the trailer, and this is a movie I wanted to see, but definitely not something I was planning on rushing out to watch in theaters. But um, for me, anything with Chris Pratt in it is definitely on my watch list. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and my wife's as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I love see. him and Jennifer Lawrence. Him and Jennifer, Lawrence, the are, him and yeah, Jennifer Lawrence are both amazing. So, I, yeah, this was pretty much... It, it checked all the boxes on my do I want to see this movie list. All right, what do you got, Travis? <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to change gears a little bit, and this change will those, probably... I'm going to start shifting. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, sure. I'll definitely edit that out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we... Um, this will definitely appeal to all of our Android fans out there, and it's, it's probably the biggest phone release of the year, and it's one that many... Um, Samsung fans look forward to, but it's going to be the, um, excuse me, the release of the Galaxy S8. So, you know, I just want to throw some rumors out. Nobody is 100% sure, although, you know, over the past month or so, there's been a lot of developments with what we think it's going to look like, but it's not just going to be a refresh, sort of like the S6 to S7 generation was more of a refresh of a good formula. This is going to be, um, you know, there's some dramatic changes coming down the pike as far as what I've seen. So, you know, a couple of things. The price, we don't know for sure. Um, and this could turn off a lot of phone buyers because I've been reading articles about it. But um, they're guessing anywhere from like 850 to to $1,000 for the phone, depending on... For the phone? For the phone, depending on which model you get. There's going to be a smaller screen version and a larger screen version. So, yeah, the, the price is, is definitely going up, it seems. That sounds let stupid. Let me know when the <laughs> S10 gets here. Say that, Dave? I'm sorry? I said, let me know when the S10 gets here. <laughs> yeah, it'll be... Uh, Fifteen hundred. Um, so moving on. Why from, is it so expensive? It's just the premium design, and people will buy them. I guess. It's not an iPhone. I mean, so it's well. not. I wouldn't say premium. Is the word <laughs> oh, okay. Do okay. Um, Second rate. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as um, some other features, we're looking at uh, only a curved edge display. There will not be no more flat screens after this for the phone. Um, either model, it's going to be the Edge. Um, I think it's just going to be called the S8 and the S8 Plus. Um, so, you know, if you're a fan of that with the S7. The plus and you, being like the new version of the Note? Uh, no, there's not going to be a stylus with it. There will be a Note still coming out. There's still plans to come out with a new Note. So it's somewhere in between those two? What? Like the S8 Plus. The S8 Plus is just a larger screen. But not as large as the Note? Um, it's it's going to be bigger than the Note. So that's what was going to be the next thing I was going to get to. <laughs> okay. The thing that differentiates the Note mainly, it has been the screen size. Like they, The Note has always had the biggest screen size, but it's also been about the stylus that was built into the phone. That was Why would the you want a bigger screen without a stylus? That's just what people want. People like their big screens. So getting to the screen, yeah, do. Um, <laughs> it's going to be huge, and there's no more home button. And it's the first phone to have uh, a huge screen-to-body ratio. So since they're getting rid of that home button in, on the front, now pretty much all but a little sliver at the top and the bottom will be screen. So the screen takes up most of the front of the phone now. Um, which is going to be interesting, and it's it's even wider. It's not it's not it's like longer. It's taller than it is wide. You see what I'm saying? So they're just stretching the screen up and down, and not widening it out, just so it fits in your hand more comfortably when you're trying to hold it. Okay. So, I don't think I like it. Yeah, we'll have to see. The 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 uh, it's definitely the jury's out for me there. Um, they're going to change up the screen, make it a little bit sharper because they want to really focus and get the Gear VR, the next generation of that, to have a non pixelated um, screen. So we're looking at a 5.8 inch screen and a 6.2 inch screen, which will definitely be the biggest ever offered on. Um, any Samsung phone, for that matter. So those are the big things. Uh, 
the back, the fingerprint scanner will be moved to the back of the phone more than likely. There's been rumors that it will be built into the front of the screen. You wouldn't even be able, be able to see that it was there. It would just be, you know, like an invisible fingerprint scanner. Definitely water resistant. An iris scanner so you can log in. It'll scan your eyeball. Um, they did have that on the Note, but then obviously the Note had all the issues with the battery, so it kind of didn't get that positive attention. But I think they're throwing a lot at the wall here, and while none of this is really confirmed except for the larger screens, we do know that's going to happen. Um, there could be a lot of innovation happening here, and whether or not you like it, like Dave seems to be kind of befuddled by a few of these features, but... Um, yeah, it should definitely be a big release. Uh, uh, end of now, March. Wasn't it, end of March. Now, wasn't it Galaxy who had like that big recall? Yeah, that's what the Travis Note was talking seven about was the, the Note. They were blowing the up, yeah. catching on fire. So they're trying to like kind of maybe go up and beyond with this one to get some of that yes. fanfare back. Maybe. And I then mean, as long the as they regular don't S7 was fine. Yeah, the S7 had no issues. That's what I have, so that'll be good for the next three years, and then the S10 will be out. <laughs> and that'll just go right <laughs> on your head. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a chip. It'll just be like plant. a contact lens? or Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. So we'll see. It's just, you know, this kind of stuff, it's frustrating, but at the same time, it's, it's cool because I love tech. I know you guys love tech, but I the, love it. the rate at which stuff changes, it's just so fast these days. Like, you... You have the newest, greatest thing for like a week. And then they're already talking about right. the next newest, greatest thing. So no, uh, I agree. it's tough. It's tough to keep up with tech, but it should be interesting to see. All right, Todd, what's your next? Okay, so next thing I'm excited about um, is another show. But this isn't necessarily a TV show. This is actually a web series. Um, and this series is called Tabletop, um, and it's about board games, so that's awesome. Um, it's Tabletop is getting into its fourth season right now, and um, so Tabletop is a show web series hosted by Will Wheaton uh, from Star Trek and uh, kind of the Nerdist and uh, Geek and Sundry and things like that. He's, you know, he's semi-famous, but famous enough in geek culture. Um, and he plays board games with uh, other internet celebrities, some big cele- other bigger celebrities from show, uh, TV shows and movies, and you know, you just know you know. he's on Star Trek, right? Yeah, I said he was from Star Trek. Okay, just making sure. I consider Who's... that more than semi-famous, but I uh, <laughs> Star Trek. <laughs> Star Trek is semi-famous. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's not go overboard. Okay. It was a long time ago when he was really young. I'm just going to send any emails we get to you, Todd. That's great. He's semi-famous. We know who he is. <laughs> I bet you not that many others. I could ask a bunch of people. They wouldn't know who he was. Okay. But anyway, anywho, continue. So, like I said, this this show actually is one of the big things that really got me into hobby board gaming. Um, watching them play games like Pandemic... Uh, King of Tokyo way back when The Resistance I think that was the first time where I saw The Resistance played Uh, Instantly bought it after watching it Um, Again, same thing with Pandemic So those were some of the first games I bought when getting to the hobby So this show was definitely right there uh, Helping me get in And finding a love for the games Um, The thing about this season Is uh, In kind of beginning of last year Middle of last year Um, Tabletop was originally produced and uh, sent out on Geek and Sundry, which is a uh, website uh, about, makes a lot of movies, a lot of different shows, but they were bought by Legendary Pictures, and um, Legendary Pictures likes Tabletop a lot, so they wanted to make Tabletop an exclusive for their streaming service, which is called Alpha. Um, so you pay like six hours a month and you can watch all their shows. So it was originally released on Alpha back in November. And, you know, so a few months it's been on there. But now, since I think I think two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, um, now they're releasing the episodes on just regular Geek and Sundry. You can also watch them on YouTube. 
Um, so and a new episode comes out every two weeks. So four episodes have aired so far, um, free that you can watch on YouTube. Um, the first game they played was Lanterns, really fun game. Um, you know, quick, easy. You know, you know, take a couple actions. Um, next game they played was Champions of Midgard, fun action worker placement game. The third game they played was called Monarch, which I had I never heard of, but that was a really fun game. Uh, just a couple action selections, um, buy stuff, sell stuff, things like that. And the last game they just played this past week was Tiny Epic Galaxies, which was looked like a really fun game. I definitely want to try that out. So um, yeah, so that show is now back in the mainstream every two weeks. Check it out. I'm super excited about it. How, yeah, uh, I've, I've seen a couple of these episodes. I don't watch it, like, on a regular basis, but um, if there's, like, a particular game that I want to see a little bit more in-depth play of, then mm-hmm. um, Tabletop's a good resource to get that because they actually play, like, a full game on those episodes, and I think that's pretty cool. So these episodes can be hours long? No, no, no. They'll play no, they, a game, yeah. They but they, uh, you know, they edit it down. Each episode's like forty minutes. Okay. Um, so They'll in the like beginning, speed it up. yeah. So in the beginning, they kind of take their time and show you what you're doing and explain the games to you, and what you can do. But after a while, they just pick it up and okay. you know, have cuts and it's. I mean, it's a very well produced show, and mm-hmm. um, you mm-hmm. know, they interview all the contestants afterwards and they give little snippets. It's very funny. Like, these people who normally get on there, Will has normally really good, you know, personal relations with, so they're all friends. There's a bunch of witty banter. You know, they're cracking jokes. You know, they're really smart, intelligent people who make the show. And um, it's a lot of actors and comedians. Is it PG? So So, yeah, they really play it up, and, you know, they make it super entertaining. Some episodes I'm... Laughing out loud, crying, they're so funny. You know, just reactions of when, you know, certain people are losing and yeah. others are winning. It's just super funny. Is it PG or, what, I mean, do they say things that are... No, it's it's definitely PG. Okay. Um, you know, any curse words are bleeped out, anything like that. There have been a couple episodes where they've, like, they one episode last season, season three, they played Cards Against Humanity. Ah. And, you know, that's a game where you really can't. Yeah, where you'd be it's not that, out So PG. that was there. That was tabletop after dark, and there was nothing was censored and, you know, a lot of cursing, but it was really funny. They had, uh, you know, a stand-up comedian on, and it was just... Yeah. Really cool. So, but yeah, most of it's all, you know, family friendly. They play, you know, super good family games, games we like and talk about, um, you know, Ticket to Ride, if they King of Tokyo. This season later on, they'll play Flash Flashpoint. You already you know. mentioned Lanterns. That's a great yeah. family game. Yeah. So, they're not, you know, they're not playing the heaviest of games. It's cuz they definitely this is a show that really helps people get into the hobby like it did with me. So they don't want to overwhelm people with craziness. Gotcha. They do play heavy games, though. Like, you mentioned oh, yeah, Champions yeah. of Midgard. That's not oh, yeah. light. Yeah, it's they a, do. Yep. a heavier worker placement type game, which yeah. I've recently purchased and have not got to the table yet. But No, really? Well, no. But that's another story. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's tabletop. Cool. Check it out. All right. So my next uh, topic is called Plague Inc. So, I don't know, did either of you guys ever play the, like, phone app Plague Inc. where you're, like, a bacteria or a virus and you're trying to mutate and um, infect as much of the world as you can? I haven't. Never heard of it. <laughs> okay. So, um, it, it was a fairly popular app that came out, and I think it was free originally, and then eventually they started charging for it and because people would pay for it. And uh, oh. recently they have made it into a board game. Oh. And I've, I've gotten to play that board game recently. And it's basically the exact opposite of Pandemic. Okay. So it's not cooperative. It's not trying to cure a disease. 
it's a competitive game where you are trying to... It's kind of take that, actually. Okay. You're trying to um, out-compete all these other bacteria and viruses and um, kill as much of the planet as you can before you run out of time. So you control and zones and stuff? Like control the world with your plague? Yeah, kind of. There's okay. a there's an area control mechanism to it. I'd consider it more of like an engine builder type of game. So you have a hand of cards, and you're playing those cards onto your um, bacteria and creating it, like mutating it. Yeah. And it gives you new abilities, like one's waterborne, so you can infect ah. uh, port cities without being in another port city or um there's climate tokens on some of the cities so you might need heat resistance in order to take over uh salt lake city or something like that and um so as you grow your bacteria you get more ability to like spread your virus so you have uh, infectivity determines how many new uh, cities you can infect each turn. And then you have a lethality count, which is how you determine whether you destroy a country or not. Ah. So, like, if North America has six spots on it, then you, once all six of those spots are filled by a bacteria, it doesn't all have to be the same bacteria, but... Um, once all six are filled, then you roll a dice. Okay. And if it is above your lethality number, then you kill that country. The and whole thing. whoever has the most bacteria in that country gets to claim that as oh. their destroyed continent. And that also gives you additional cards that you can um, upgrade with later. And it gives you a bonus that is like a special action you can take on a future turn. Um, they've thought of everything yeah it's a lot of fun it's uh, I don't know did I ever play evolution with either of you guys yeah you did with me okay Ah. so it's similar to that but it's it's more specific to your bacteria rather than trying to eat you're trying to kill the country how long did it take how long a play was it um, I think, well, okay, so <laughs> I've played it probably three times now. Okay. And the box says 45 minutes. Okay. And if you have all players who know what they're doing and are not very analysis paralysis prone, then it could easily take 45 minutes. But... None of the games I've played have met that scenario. Okay. The first one, we had a guy who was really slow, and I think the game took probably close to two hours, which yeah. was painful. Right. Um, but it didn't turn me off from the game, so that says quite a bit, actually. That's good. Um, and then the next time I played it, it probably took an hour and 15, maybe. Okay. Okay. And then... Probably around that for the most recent time as well. Okay. So, well, you, but, I mean, eh, that's not too would you, bad. Would you buy it? Um, I haven't picked it up yet, but I mean, obviously, you can play it kind of regularly. You know, my thing with buying it is I don't know if it's different enough from Evolution for me to want to pick it up. Okay. It's a good game, and I would buy it, but I think that it might be a little too close, and I kind of already have that niche feel. So okay, that makes sense. Okay, yeah. How many people do you need to play it? Um, I think you can play it with two. Okay, but it plays the so the original game is four, and it was a Kickstarter, I think. Yeah. And I've seen some people have a fifth player expansion to it. Gotcha. So I'm not sure if that's just a Kickstarter exclusive or if that's something you can still pick up. But Okay. It plays at least four. All right. Cool. 
So what do you got, Travis? Well, for me, um, my next piece of Kraken news is um, a game that I actually got to play recently with you, Dave, um, called World of Yoho by Yellow Games. Um, And this is definitely a fantasy-type game where you take on the role of a pirate. So the game starts, you get to choose your captain of the ship essentially and you get to choose your ship itself and depending on which one you choose the card says things that you're able you're able to do it's almost like directions that you can play throughout the game like I chose one where you know my character was had extra health or something like that but yet at the same time anytime I was near another enemy ship I had to engage that ship and fight it so you have these kind of actions that are tied to your character or your ship. Um, So the real kicker, though, with this game is that the board is quite large, and it's very well illustrated. You know, it's got different little islands and things strewn about it. But you use your phone as essentially your pawn. It's what shows your ship and everything. and um, That's your play piece. Your play piece, yeah, your token. And... At the same time, it also helps drive the entire game. I mean, you really have to play with the phone. There's no other way to pick up quests. It's very quest-driven, like you're trying to get to this island and explore the island to find this item, or um, you have to attack a ship to get this or whatnot. So the phone drives the game. It has all the situations in it. And I think it's a really neat concept. the only thing that was an issue for when we played Dave, and I'm sure you would agree, was the amount of time it took us to get through the thing. Um, because, yeah. And it was weird because Dave said that he had played it before, and it didn't take nearly that long. But then when we played it, it took like three hours, it felt like. <laughs> um, but I think there's some really cool tech there. I mean, using the phone, it's fairly accurate about when you move that phone, which has your ship floating on it, and there's sound effects and stuff, which is fun. When you move it to the next square, it can sense the movement of your phone, and it moves the ship with your phone, so it looks like it's actually moving across the game board. So it's pretty sweet in that respect, for sure. But, you know, your goal is to get to a predetermined, depending on what your your um, table party decides, uh, a predetermined set amount of points, I think. Right, Dave? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to jump in on the time thing, too. Jump in. So... Adrian and I played the night before, and we played to 400 points, and we played a two-player game in 30, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And when we played with Travis, we were playing a four-player game to 700 points, (laughs) which maybe wasn't the best idea. (laughs) But um, I think maybe having new players, that might have been not the best idea. Should have just kept it to 400, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it took over two hours, I think. It did, yeah. Um, but they did a good job. It, it was... Um, I think it felt monotonous because we had been playing it for so long. Not necessarily because of the game design itself. I mean, <clears throat> there were always sea monsters and things that would pop up and you'd have to battle them. Um, I know I could have done a little bit better with the resource management. You have to sail into a port in order to be able to interact with the island and buy certain supplies. And since my ship and my captain just so happened to be one of the ones that had to engage a ship if it was next to it, um, I often ran out of basically supplies to fight with. So that was one of the strategies that I didn't really do too well. But, um, you know, there's a decent amount going on in the game to where I feel like had it not have taken three hours it would have been more enjoyable. But I definitely enjoyed it. I think to some extent, it it was just... The other thing with, like, when Adrian and I played two-player, there wasn't very much battling involved. Yeah. So we always had our missions, and we just went for them, and that was it. Yeah. When you play four-player, if you lose in battle, you lose any objectives that you have. Oh, yes, that's true. So that kept setting us back also. And if nobody's and was, achieving an objective, then we're not getting... Nobody's getting anywhere. It's just... Yeah, that's how you get the points, yeah. so... 
it just kind of made you go around in circles. All right. Um, yeah, I, I haven't played this game, but I know of it. And, you know, one of the big things about this game is, like you said, Travis, using your phone. Yeah. And how that integrated, you know, with the board game. And, you know, I hope from what I can tell with that, the technology and like how well you said it worked. And I know other, people's have th- other people have thought that as well. That other games, you know, try to do that kind of... In- integrate that same thing Mm -hmm. you know using your phone as a piece or using your phone to maybe help keep secret information and just you know board games you know use that tech to think of new mechanics and new ways to play and yeah everything like that so that that's exciting definitely from that standpoint yeah i I definitely agree i just think that um you just have to i'm just a little bit weary because i want it to be able to enhance the game and not i don't know take away from the interactive nature that is a game so i'm right. just i just i don't want the the phone and the tech to get in the way of that because board games are one of those things that you don't need technology to play normally right. and, and it doesn't if you don't have a phone you can't play so that at the you're out of you luck. know yeah so you're out of luck so i think i think this game did a pretty good job of that because so in our game, it was a little different because you were kind of in the screen of your phone just because you were reading the tutorial. Yeah. But I think after you know the game, your actions are all pretty quick. You're not staring at your phone. And additionally, you can't be texting on the side because your phone's on the board. <laughs> yeah, and I will right. say it killed. Uh, my phone was at like 85%, and after the three hours, the thing was saying, plug me in. I mean, it, oh it was almost dead, so. All right, so that's, that's you got to worry about that. you got to worry about that. You play a game for two and a half hours, all of a sudden at the end your phone just dies and it's all over. Yeah. That would be, that would have been bad. Well, yeah, it was, like, three of our four phones were all beeping, like, plug us in. Yeah. It was kind of like an iPhone commercial because Adrian's was the only one that was still going. <laughs> yeah, it was the only of one still going. Of course, I mean, hey, I mean, well, I mean, what can you say? I uh, mean, uh, but some anyways, things are just better at some things. I agree with Dave. I think that it, now that I know what's happening, and we kind of had a better hey, sense for. Don't get me off course. <laughs> what? I don't know. You're just trying to throw me off. Trying to change talking topic. Good talking well about iPhones. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that now Todd's that got a revel in him. He's got to just take whatever he can get. Um, yep. Yeah, I would definitely like to play it again now that I know what's happening and. It would yeah, be fun. To try it out too. Not to seven hundred points. No, again. no, no. <laughs> Alrighty. So yeah, that's what's cracking for this month. It's time for another in-depth review. All right. So for this episode's in-depth review, we are going to talk about Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Um, it's something that we've all been chopping at the bit to discuss ever since we all saw it. We all went out and saw it. You know fairly quickly after it was released um, because it's definitely one of those iconic films. It's part of Star Wars, unlike the little-known Star Trek that Dave and Todd were talking about earlier. Hey, hey, hey. (laughs) Um, It was on for a long time. It's not little-known. I'm just teasing. Um, Some people have seen that. So just a quick synopsis, and I do mean quick. Uh, There is a scientist, an engineer, who we see at the beginning of the film. Uh, Galen Erso is his name, and in the movie, if you've seen the trailers, you know it involves him, and there's a hint at the Death Star. Um, He ends up being the lead engineer for the Death Star, and there's definitely a struggle of, you know, morality versus being told what he is should be doing because they threaten his family and whatnot. So anyways, his daughter was Jin. We see her at a very young age. She ends up escaping with the help of some of father's friends. And we see her um, pretty much for the entirety of the film grown up um, with her goal being to stop the development of this Death Star um, with her and like a ragtag group of... I don't know, rebels, essentially. And um, it's it's a definitely a very, very good um, action film. A lot of battle and stuff, which 
uh, it was a departure from what we, we have seen in the other ones. I mean, there was fighting in those two, but it definitely was a lot more action heavy. Um, and this slots in between episode three and four and kind of fills in that, that blank space that was left there. Yeah. So, um, I really enjoyed the, the movie, um, I think Travis did a pretty good little synopsis there for us, but... Try not to get stuff will... away. <laughs> yeah, definitely we don't want to do spoilers, so... So I've I've always been a pretty big um, Star Wars fan. I think I saw them out of the proper order. I No, I, I guess I saw episodes four through six, but that was a long time ago. And then I saw episodes one through three more recently... And then as this one was getting ready, or not this one, uh, episode seven was getting ready to come out, I went back and rewatched all of them with Adrian. So um, by the time they announced this one, I was pretty pumped for it. So I think it was hyped up a lot, and I think that, in my opinion, it's lived up to that hype. I agree. Yeah, definitely... um Def- I definitely really enjoy this movie as well. Travis, like you said, you know, it has a ragtag bunch, and I love ragtag bunches. <laughs> you um, do. You know, Captain America you know, Civil War. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> like that. Um, and, you know, like you said, this, these are the events that lead right up to, you know, episode four, literally, where, where this movie ends, that movie begins. Uh-huh. So so that, that was really cool. Um, the characters in this movie a lot different um you know in making this movie they knew going into it that this they wanted to this they kind of wanted this to be like a darker story Mm -hmm. than the the main episodes and it it definitely is you know with everything that happens in the film um you know some really cool characters you know just like uh you know the first six movies and you know episode seven they definitely have like their cool droid you know, uh, K2SO, he's he's like kind of like the comedic, you know, mm-hmm. comedic relief of the of the movie. Um, so he's funny. Um, yeah, but Tudyk. he also comes in and kicks butt when he yeah, needs to. Yeah, he's also to. a badass too. Yeah. So that's that's super cool. Um, Definitely not like C3 where he would just run away. Oh lord! Oh lord! <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So yeah, and he can he can talk, so that's cool too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that was a really cool character. Um, I did not expect that that was Alan Tudyk. Like, that wasn't... His voice didn't ring into that character for me. But I, I'm i not saying that he didn't do a good job. I no. think he did an amazing, but... Yeah, he's he's just really good at voices, you know? He can. Yeah. He has a very wide range of things he can do. So he's... Yeah, he's super awesome. So what did you guys think about the... The plot, kind of? I mean, without giving away spoilers, mm-hmm. just... How do you think that this fit into the Star Wars universe in general? Um, I thought it fit well into the um, the universe. I, the only gripe I had with the film that kind of relates to plot is the fact that I didn't feel like, and it's hard to do this in films when you have so many characters that you're following, like the bunch in this group, it's hard to make you feel like you can actually relate to each character enough to where when it comes down to the end of the movie, you can feel either happy or sad for the outcome, depending on, you know, right. whatever happens with them. So that would be the only place in this movie that I felt like it lacked because it all happens so fast. Um, it was just hard to feel truly... I don't know, empathetic for them all. Right, because unlike the other movies, you know, where you have multiple movies with the same characters, yeah. you just have that, you know. Yeah. It's just so easy just to, you know, one, there's more to follow. Do you, you see more with them. You feel like you know them. And, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so, to, so yeah, this arc is a much faster arc mm-hmm. with these characters, you know. Um, and a lot, like you said, it's a ragtag bunch, so there's a lot of them. So not each one. Some of the secondary characters don't get a lot of, you know, build-up storyline. But the main characters, I believe, definitely get their mm-hmm. good, the right amount, you know. 
you know, just like the beginning with Galen and Jin, you know, you get their backstory, you feel with how, you know, their emotion and you're following them and it's easy to, you know, the certain high points of the plot, you know, you're right there on the edge of the, your seat, mm-hmm. you know, feeling it along with them. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So that's good. There's definitely good emotional spots. Um, this is a very, you know, action-y and but very dramatic story within the within the arc. So I have two main thoughts on this plot. Um, and I think the first is that I felt like it was kind of restricted in the fact that because it was sandwiched in between episodes three and four, they have to fit what's going to happen into that. You know, they can't really deviate too much from what's already been established. Yeah, because they have somewhere they're going already. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was constrained in that that aspect, but um, I think they did a pretty good job in general, but I think there was a serious lack of Jedi in this movie. Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. I would have liked to have seen more lightsabers. I don't think you saw any until the end there, really. Nope. But, uh, I don't know. It was different than the other Star Trek movies because there was no Jedi in it. It was a, it was just a different feel because they're not more than what we are, I guess. They're just kind of like a normal person trying to fit into this universe, and that's that's a little different than what Star, Tri- Star Wars has been. Yeah, so. and... To go off of that, we can relate more because none of us are Jedis unless you guys haven't been telling me something. Um, (laughs) But no, it's just like normal people. These are not the droids you're looking for. I guess not. But if, you know, (laughs) if I am one with the Force, the Force will be with me. So that's, at least that's what I hear. And, you know, they, I mean, they could have easily inserted like a Jedi here and there, but that doesn't fit with the storyline. In this timeline in the Star Wars story, there's no Jedis around. Like, that's yeah. the main thing. So, I mean, yeah, if they threw a Jedi in there, it probably would have got a lot more fanfare and people would have had that, oh, yeah, moment. But that's just that's just not what can happen, you know? And normally when you talk when you, in, the, in the Star Wars universe, when you're talking about, like, the Force, you know, you're really... The main thing you see is, like, the you know, the lightsaber fights and, like, lightning and everything like that. But you, you don't really under... You don't get to see a lot of, like, the Force as, like, a religion. You know that's kind of what it is in in Star Wars. It's yeah. It's that it's that belief and presence entity. into something, you know, beyond yourself, some higher power. You know, yeah. it's just the Force. So it's you got to really see that aspect of it, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, that is yeah. true. <laughs> so I do kind of. A... Go ahead, Dave. I was just gonna say it kind of puts a magnifying glass on. Um, the things that you're not seeing in the other Star Wars right. movies. Yeah, that is true. Um, but I do have a random question. How do you guys feel about the lack of the rolling credits at the beginning? Not credits, but the opening. Dun, 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 dun. I was thrown off by it. Yeah? Yeah. I was, like, waiting for it to come, and then they just kind of jumped in. I'm like, wait, what? Wait, did I, am I in the right and, movie? <laughs> yeah, like, did, did I miss it? Like, yeah. I wasn't in the bathroom, was I? <laughs> <And this wasn't laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But on the same time, that makes, you know, the episodes that's, that have that extra special thing. So, you know, this year when episode eight comes out, we can look forward to that part, you know. So, again, it's that thing that separates these films. Yeah. Now, I'm curious. Have either one of you talked to any of your friends that have seen it and gotten their feedback? What have you heard? Well, you guys are my friends that have seen it. So. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> But I went, I went, I went and watched it with my wife. She she liked it as well, you know. Has she seen all of them? She's and she's not like a you know huge Star Wars fan. Yeah. You know she she doesn't mind the movies. You know she she likes the original, you know episodes four through six better than most episodes. people do. Yeah. So she's you know she's right there with that. You know she loves the Wookies. You know. <laughs> so you know she likes it. And yeah. she liked episode seven, and she liked this movie. Well, good. Even for not a yeah. big Star Wars fan, it's just a good movie. Yeah. I've talked to other people. I, I didn't get a lot of specifics out of them, 
Um, I I've gotten a lot of comments about the way it ended, but I don't want to spoil yeah. that. If no, right. I I assume most people have seen it by now. But you never know. Um, if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about with the ending. If you haven't, go see it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, most people have enjoyed it. There's, it's just that that sort of conflict that I've heard most. All right. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. You know, the ending, people, you know, it can be kind of bittersweet. People like it or people not. I can see it being polarizing. Um, I personally, you know, I didn't, I didn't mind the way it ended because I could see it creating. If it ended differently. I could see it That's creating, how it had to end. Yeah, I could see it creating problems going further, you know. There'd kind of be some hiccups within, like, the timeline and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I think it, just, it ended the way, it, it, like you said, it ended the way it had to. Yeah. Which was still really cool. Yeah, they did a good job with that, for sure. They tied it in pretty flawlessly. Um, so now we're going to move into uh, the rating portion of our film and for our listeners out there who may be tuning in for the first time welcome um and so the way we do our ratings is we base them on the six pack scale since we are the d six pack and in this case um a zero out of six or a one would be that was a waste of two and a half hours of my life never want to see that again kill me now and was was throwing popcorn at the screen yes just (laughs) constantly yelling screaming um and then a six would be i've seen it 10 times i have the blu-ray deluxe edition pre-ordered ready to go so you you pi oh yeah yeah okay i thought you pirated the copy oh yeah well yeah we we don't do that we don't support that Um, good 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 but anyways dave let's throw it over to you what do you think buddy yeah um so i i enjoyed the movie um for me, I'm kind of comparing this to the other Star Wars films. So, um, it was good. I don't think it was necessarily the best out of the series, though, because of those constraints that I've already mentioned. Um, but it's definitely better than your average movie, um, science fiction movie. But um, So, for that reason, and I feel like I'm giving a lot of these out, but I'm going to give it a four. Okay. I think it's above average, but I don't think it's um, quite up to par with the other movies. So that's where I'm at. All right, Todd? I'm kind of in the same boat as David. Um, This was obviously a super popular movie. This was the second highest grossing movie worldwide of the year. Just behind, you know, Civil War. You know, I just want to... <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Maybe another one. Just, I just want to, you know... Just, Get a just stick just in say, there. I just want to say, you know, throw that out there, you know. But um, in, like David did, comparing to this to all the other Star Wars movies, definitely better than some, you know. I would say probably, to me, better than most. I really liked it. Um, for me, it's probably a 5 out of 6. It could have been a 4 out of 6, but I think I just liked it a little extra... You know, with the newer Star Wars movies, I'm de- I love, you know, CGI, better graphics than the originals. Yeah. You know, I just, I just, I like that. You know, I can understand when I, when that. I go back and watch those movies, I like the story and everything, but, you know, I can't, I can't help but notice the old style. <laughs> yeah. You know, so having this, having like these characters and just seeing, you know, the ATSTs and all the machinery and, you know, the ships and everything, just in sweet, brand new ass CGI is awesome. And that kind of that kind of puts it over the edge for me. So for me, it's a five out of six. OK, um, I'm right there with Todd, too. I definitely can appreciate things that are more visually appealing um, than this. Definitely because it was, you know, made just last year and obviously the production started before that but um, it's a newer more modern movie so they have the newer more modern tools to make it it looks great great action flick um, I, and like Todd said as well I love the original storyline and this tied in well to it so I'm definitely looking forward to where they're going to go with these future you know stories that they kind of tie in as well so I give it a five out of six Yeah, so now I think it's time for us to move into our brew review. Let's review that brew. All right, so we've been sipping on Breckenridge Brewery's 
oatmeal stout throughout this episode. Heavy emphasis I my on second. sipping for me. <laughs> oh, no. Dave, is that your second one? Yeah. yeah Halfway through it. Ish. Yeah, I'm well, about, to, about to take my last swig here. That's a big swig. <laughs> okay, last couple swigs, all right? <laughs> all right. So, um, Travis. <laughs> Dave, I've been seeing your facial expressions yeah. throughout this episode, so let's go to you first. You've had the pleasure of witnessing that. Um, I really, really don't like this. Um, and let me tell you why. I don't know what it is, but I've been kind of doing some little experiments over here. Um, for one, I'm not a huge fan of coffee in general, unless it's got creamer and sugar, lots of sugar, so essentially just sugar <laughs> milk. Um, that's what I enjoy. So... This has that bitter, bitter aftertaste. And so what I've noticed is if I just chug it really quickly, I don't really notice it as badly. But I've also been, you know, I let it sit in my face to, or my face. (laughs) I let it sit in my mouth. I just pour it on my (laughs) face. Um, I let it sit in my mouth to try to see what kind of flavors there are to separate. (laughs) And when I swallow it, it's just this overwhelming. It just makes my face pucker. It is disgusting, and I, uh, I really didn't enjoy it. So I'm sure there are worse beers out there. Um, I'd say one and a half or two out of six for me. This is not something that I would go back to if I had a choice, and I would really even try really hard not to drink it. If somebody was trying to force me to, so yeah. Either That's way, I don't. Though. I don't want it. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, Todd. Um, uh, with Travis, I do definitely agree. The aftertaste super bitter. Um, that's definitely in beer. That's one of my least favorite things. You know, the bitter the aftertaste, the worst. But the actual taste of the beer, um, definitely strong coffee. You know, I guess oatmeal stout, it's not necessarily in taste. It's more in just the feel, you know, the heavy creaminess. Right. You, know, you can definitely feel that. Um, you, like we said at the beginning, very, very dark beer, which, you know, are normally, yeah, uh, no, you know, have that feel to them. Um, I've, I've had this beer for a long ass time. I don't know if it's. Not old or anything, but no, that's uh, what it's supposed to taste like. Okay, <laughs> well, okay. you know, like, you know <laughs> something's wrong when you got to okay. ask. Not sure if this is old or not, but it's <laughs> <Not sure laughs> past expiration date. But um, yeah, I just definitely it wasn't a hit for me. Uh, not something I want to come back to. I'm probably in the same boat as Travis. Um, a two, maybe a three, but. Most likely a two or a six <laughs> for me on this one as well. Yeah, I can see where you guys are coming from. It's a bitter taste. Uh, that's just kind of something that comes along with an oatmeal stout. Um, I feel like I've probably had a few more of those than you guys have, but right. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I. I do understand the coffee taste. It adds a bitterness to the beer that some people probably aren't going to enjoy. But if you like oatmeal stouts, this one has that heavy, creamy flavor to it that is comparable to others. Um, However, I wouldn't say that this is the best oatmeal stout I've had. Okay. Um, It's... It's probably subpar, actually. Um, I'm kind of interested to try some other Breckenridge Brewery beers because this is the first one I've tried. Um, But, I don't know. This is... It's not bad, but it's not... Not premium. It's it's not something... Like, if I'm looking for an oatmeal stout, Breckenridge Brewery is not the one that I'm looking for. Okay. Um... But it, it's it's not bad. I wouldn't turn one down in the future if someone offered it to me. So I will give it a more generous rating than either of you, but I'm going to say it's average. It's a three. 
Yeah, it's definitely, so, you know, that coffee taste, I don't mind if it's paired with something a little better. You know, like a vanilla or like a like a chocolatey, you know, kind of... Mocha type thing. ...thing, but the oatmeal just didn't, didn't do it for me. Yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Not, and not to mention... This isn't going to be for everybody. Some people yeah. just don't like these heavy stout beers, but... Right. I think we should have all been turned off initially by the creepy moon on the front. Yeah, the design. When somebody's staring at you like that. The bottle does have a very creepy moon on it. I don't I don't understand it. I don't know what that has to do with oatmeal stout. I don't want to understand it. He's like he's like, you bout to drink some shit. That's what he's saying. Ooh, yeah. I can't even look at you fully. <laughs> Maybe one of our listeners can explain it to us. Maybe. 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 Why is there a creepy moon on an oatmeal stout? I think that's pretty much it for our brew review. Um, that's our show. Until next time, play hard and drink responsibly. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of D6 Pack. We'd love for you to let us know about your favorite Star Wars movie or character via any of our social media pages. You can find us at D6 Pack Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, so be sure to leave your comments there. We hope you'll tune in next month for our thoughts on Atwater Traverse City Cherry Wheat, reveal our top six superhero movies, and a ton more nerdy entertainment. As always, D6 Pack is not affiliated with any products discussed during this podcast, and all opinions are those of the creators.